the subject of my talk this evening is how to recognize a saint and this is part 2 of my talk on the same subject some listeners had requested me to give another part that's why i am giving there is a story it is in india a person came to a certain town and he had some special power <laughs> he could grant like a pig and not only that when he would grant like a pig other pigs which were around would come to him so by seeing that people became very interested and then <laughs> he would bring some pigs who which will be around him and when he would grant like a pig the pigs would come and grant also with him that was a great show and he started charging money and many people came to see him many people and then he got a lot of money and he started became rich in that town there was a monastery and one day the abbot of that monastery asked the junior monks to do something he said to them go and borrow a pig from one of our members and bring that pig and put that pig outside in a pen and the <coughs> junior monks did that and a sign was put outside if you want to hear the <laughs> granting of a genuine pig then come here there will be no charges several days passed but not a single person came <laughs> then the abbot said to the junior monks now you may return the pig to its owner and that was done after that the abbot asked the junior monks have you learned the lesson they couldn't understand what lesson <laughs> they should have learned said the weird sir please tell us what lesson he said the lesson is that most people are not interested in what is genuine they are interested in something which is not genuine this is true for saints also this genuine saints very few people can recognize them in the first place and not too many people will be attracted to a genuine saint <laughs> hinduism has six systems of religious philosophy the earliest one of them is called sankhya philosophy it says that at the beginning there was consciousness called purusha and there is also mother nature prakriti which is not conscious then prakriti borrowed consciousness from purusha and when prakriti borrowed that prakriti started evolving changing and then eventually prakriti evolved as the as this world in which we live 
and prakriti is composed of three qualities <laughs> or not qualities three gunas they are called gunas <laughs> a guna also guna that word has also one meaning which is means a rope <laughs> so prakriti is like a rope which is three thinner ropes have been wound together to create that rope which is prakriti and this gunas three gunas have three names one is called satva guna the other is then called raja guna the third one is called tama guna everything which is in this world including you all you are made of these three gunas because you have evolved from mother nature or prakriti and satva guna has this quality that is these qualities that is it is calm serene peaceful blissful and spiritual mm-hmm. and rajaguna is something which is which has vigor ambition and all these things and tamaguna is lethargy mental and physical lethargy so person any human being who is made of these three gunas actually experiences sometimes lethargy sometimes a very serene mood the mind is at the time tranquil and wants to think of holy things and all this that that time this that individual's mind has preponderance of satva guna and the same person's mind at another time will be ambitious worldly ambitious and be a lot of vigor to make himself or herself important and all these things at that time the rajaguna has become manifested in that person at another time a person mind is sluggish sleepy and that shows that the mind of that person at that time has preponderance of tamaguna these these three gunas they are together like three siblings and they want to playfully wrestle with one another and sometimes satva guna goes to the top <laughs> and the other gunas are subdued and sometimes raja guna goes to the top in wrestling and the other two gunas go become subdued the same with tama guna sometimes tama guna goes to the top but they always cooperate with one another they are never alone that's what that <laughs> sankhya philosophy teaches us also we get to know another thing which is very important that is every person is like a fragrant flower its fragrance form a mist around that person something like a fine mist so also every person mind is like a fragrant flower and its <laughs> its fragrance is forms outside like a mist a zone of influence and those the minds human minds they are composed of extremely fine particles they are called tanmatras 
they spread out. This tanmatra spread out and form a mist around that person. It's a person who is saintly, he has preponderance of sattva guna most of the time. That's why his tanmatras will also have preponderance of sattva guna. A person who has Rajaguna preponderant in him at that time, his Tanmatras will also have the qualities of Rajaguna. The same with Tamaguna when it will become preponderant, the Tanmatras will be Tamaguna. That's why in our tradition it is said, try to have holy company. The saints Tanmatras are most of the time they have. They have from Satta Guna. So, if one can enter into the mist of those such Tanmatras, then that person, if that person is receptive, that person may be spiritually benefited. That's why the necessity for holy company is there. Once one person came to Sri Ramakrishna and <coughs> said, asked, Sir, what is the goal of human life? Sri Ramakrishna said, the goal of human life is to experience divinity. And how can it be done? By chanting the holy name of God most of the time, keeping the mind busy thinking of God. And also having holy company. Because holy company, from that a person will get the benefit of holy tanmatras. So, <clears throat> there is a story in the Bible that once some Pharisees brought a woman to Jesus. And Jesus was a rabbi, he was a teacher, he was in the temple. And they said, Sir, this woman has committed adultery. And she was. And that's why she has been brought here. And according to Moses, such a woman should be stoned to death. And some other, some people came also, they were standing around with the rocks in their hands. And then this very says, ask Jesus, what do you say you should do? And Jesus went on writing on the ground something, <laughs> it looked like. Then after a while he raised his head and said, If there is anyone among you who has not committed any sin, let that person be the first one to throw the rock at this woman. And then the people one by one left that place. No one threw a rock at that woman. After a while Jesus asked that woman, where are those people? And she said, they are all gone. Then Jesus said, all right, you may go home, but commit, don't commit such sins anymore. So why those people who went away? Well, my understanding is that they are within the sphere of the pure tanmatras of Jesus. That's why their minds had a lift and that's why they gave up the idea of throwing rocks at that woman. That is my understanding. But anyway, so tanmatras are very important. Sri Ramakrishna's tanmatras also would change, change people. According to one report, he went to a particular home 
in the city of Calcutta and the windows had iron bars to prevent thieves to enter, I think. And then one person was outside the window and he could feel the holy tanmatras of Sri Ramakrishna coming out through that window. <laughs> that is one account. But it is not that everyone who came to Sri Ramakrishna was transformed because they were not receptive most probably. But it is also the case that Sri Ramakrishna would release his tanmatras sometimes abundantly, sometimes not. So, a saint's tanmatras are very beneficial. There is a saying, satang sangohi veshajam, the company of one who is very good is like a medicine. Would everyone recognize Sri Ramakrishna to be a divine incarnation or to speak of a saint? No, most people could not. They did not have the ability. Sri Ramakrishna was, he would sometimes he would worship the Divine Mother Kali in the temple which was founded by one very famous woman, Rani Rasmani. And while performing worship, sometimes he would start worshipping himself. That was very strange behavior. People thought that he had become eccentric. But no, he could see divinity in him. And ordinary people did not understand those things. That's why some people thought that he was eccentric. And at that time, to the temple, many holy men and women used to come. And they would be given shelter and also some food they would get. And then once one woman, a nun came. She is known as Bhairubi Brahmani. Most probably she belonged to the Tantrika sect of Hinduism. And she saw Ramakrishna and she thought he was, Sri Ramakrishna was not just a saint, but he was a divine incarnation. And he said that to Sri Ramakrishna, but he would not give any importance to that. Then she started talking to others. And the person who would who was the son in law of Rani Rasmani, his name was Mathur. He used to manage the temple complex. So this Bhairavi Brahmani said that to Mathur, that Sri Ramakrishna was a divine incarnation. Mathur had some respect for Sri Ramakrishna as a holy man, he thought. But divine incarnation, he was not sure of that. So then Bhairavi Brahmani said, Call all the scholars in scriptures and let them come and see him and give their opinion. Then Mathur was very influential, so he got many scholars from different places. The scholars in the scriptures. And they came and observed Ramakrishna. And then all of them gave this unanimous verdict that yes, all the signs and symptoms of divine incarnation are present in Ramakrishna. And what was Sri Ramakrishna doing? He was sitting there. He was this, <laughs> in the court, inner courtyard of the temple, the scholars sat and saw Ramakrishna. And Ramakrishna was sitting there as though listening to some people talking about someone else, <laughs> not about him. He didn't seem to be interested <laughs> in their 
judgment or anything because saints genuine saints and divine incarnations they don't care for public appreciation yes it is very difficult to recognize saints there was one famous saint in india his name was o hari baba he lived in a place called gajipur which is in uttar pradesh and swami vivekananda at that time narendranath dotto started coming to sri ramakrishna and sri ramakrishna he could see in and through every person when he saw narendranath dotto he knew that narendranath dotto had come to assist him in preaching spiritual ideas which would emanate from sri ramakrishna and he was he used to be one of the seven sages saptarshi in sanskrit and one of them it seems at the request of sri ramakrishna came down and was born as narendra nath but being born even if a saint or divine incarnation be becomes born and he has to enter into a prison as it were the body is the prison so they they will be subject to <laughs> bodily impulses <laughs> even diseases they will have you see so that's why it is not easy for ordinary people to recognize a saint or a divine incarnation but narendra he was spiritually interested and he came to sri ramakrishna and gradually he became attracted to him and he knew that a person when he becomes one with divinity that is the highest spiritual achievement and that happens when a person has nirvikalpa samadhi and sri ramakrishna at that time was living in a country house belonging to somebody which was in a place called kashipur some miles away from calcutta the city of calcutta he spent his last few days there that's why he passed away sri ramakrishna sri ramakrishna why did he pass away he said to sri sarada devi who was also a divine incarnation his spiritual wife he may call her he said he had said to her my time for departure from this world has come because when a king wants to help his subjects then he puts on a disguise and goes on helping the subjects but when some of the subjects recognize the king then the king has to go back to his palace that means some people a very small number of people started recognizing sri ram krishna as a divine incarnation so that's why sri ram krishna thought it was time for him to depart from this world but he left sarada devi he said what i have done is but little you have to do much more and she was also a divine incarnation he came to show the motherly compassion of god and anyway talked about her in the past so shyam krishna said to narendra you want nirvikalpa samadhi all right and when shyam krishna was in the country house in kashipur narendra suddenly had the nirvikalpa samadhi others who were there some other young people devotees they thought he had died 
because he had in nirvikalpa samadhi person becomes one with god but eventually he came back to senses and then shri ram krishna heard about it and said to narendra you are asking me for this now you have had this experience but i have i will lock it up so you will not have this samadhi again <laughs> until i decide by the time you have, will have done divine mother's work the door to this samadhi will be opened by me then narendra after the passing away of sri ram krishna he was eager to have that samadhi he was not considered a saint by others <laughs> they thought he was a devotee then he went to gajipur because he had heard of pawhari baba hoping that gova pawhari baba would be able to help him to have that samadhi but point pawhari baba was a saint he could see through narendra and he could see that narendra was a saint and so he wanted help from narendra spiritual help <laughs> at that time sri ram krishna appeared before narendra and said with a sad face that means you don't waste time here you have to do much more because sri ram krishna knew he had given his spiritual power to narendra also that he would have to go abroad and preach spirituality and all that so this narendra saintliness was not recognized by most people only pawhari baba recognized because he was a saint so there is no wonder why a genuine saint is not recognized by most people and i was speaking up tanmatras in our order we had a great saintly swami swami bishuddhananda when he was president for the why at that time the queen of nepal came to see him she had heard about the saintliness of swami bishuddhananda and so i wish the nanda was seated in a room and the queen of nepal sat there there was nobody else there she her mind had been perturbed with some problems and she was extremely worried but she came and sat there and didn't have to say a single word to so i wish the nanda just sat there after about an hour or so she said i have i have now got peace and then she left why did she get peace how because the holy tanmatra of some bishuddhananda changed her mind this is one example and then at that time Swami Shankarananda was the president of Bellur Mart. And so two young men for some reason were very critical of the Ramakrishna order because <laughs> the Ramakrishna order had built that temple and the gates would be closed they could not go it is on the bank of the river ganges and these people could not go to the <laughs> ganges all the time and so many other restrictions were there so these two young men came to complain about the activities of the ramakrishna mission and they wanted to see the president <laughs> and they were taken to swami shankarananda they had come to complain they went and sat in front of swami shankarananda 
then their minds were completely transformed. They could not complain anymore. They sat there for a while and then saluted the Swami and came out. How did it happen? The holy tonmatras of Swami Shankarananda transformed their minds. There was a holy man, a holy man, a saintly person. And in India, the donkey is considered <laughs> an idiot. <laughs> so if some person is called a donkey, that means you are an idiot. <laughs> so one person came and <laughs> said to that holy man, you are a donkey. The holy man said to that man, oh, you, am I a donkey? Let me look around and see if any donkey is around. Because if the donkey hears you calling me a donkey, then the donkey will, be, will feel insulted because I'm much worse than a donkey. So that holy man had humility. So humility is one of the great qualities of saints. I have already, already talked for 35 minutes and I was supposed to talk for half an hour only. So these are some of the characteristics of genuine saints. A genuine, you, you cannot recognize a genuine saint unless your mind is developed. But nevertheless, if you go and have the seat in front of his saint, then the holy tanmatras of the saint will benefit you. That's why where people go and think of God, their tanmatras at that time also are emitted by their bodies. That's why in some temples where people go and sit and meditate, that those the atmosphere is different. You go there and get a good feel becoming atmosphere. You sit there and your mind gradually becomes calm and serene and peaceful. That happens. I have experienced that by going to some places of worship. I am sure others also do that. And this <coughs> Swami Shankarananda was the president at that time of the Ramakrishna order. And he had become quite elderly at that time. And he called Swami Vishuddhananda. At that time, only the president would give spiritual initiation. Swami Vishuddhananda was the vice president, but he, he had, didn't have to give spiritual initiation to anybody. Then Swami Shankarananda called him and said, from now on, you have to give spiritual initiation. Vishuddhananda Swami was, he has a personification of humility. He said, no, no, who am I to give initiation? I am not fit to give initiation to anyone. Then Swami Shankaranda said to him, Yes, none of us is fit to give spiritual initiation. But Swami Krishna wants to play with counterfeit coins like us. That's how you give initiation. That's why in the Ramakrishna order, one who gives initiation is 100% sure that it is the Guru is Sri Ramakrishna. And as Sri Ramakrishna, he never thought he was a Guru. He thought that God was the Guru. Jesus also thought that way. Whatever teachings he gave, 
He said, the teachings have come from God. All right. Thank you all very much.